Do you think classical music is too difficult to listen to? Or too boring? Have you never enjoyed music classes and these unfamiliar musical terms? Some of you might have struggled with learning musical instruments. I understand. Classical music can become something to avoid. This is precisely the mindset we want to change. Look at these book piles. They look rather thick and boring, don't they? Don't you want to pick up one and start reading? No? Well, let me read you the starting passage of this one. It goes something like this. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you. Now, wasn't that something? Do you wish to continue to read it, though? Because that was the opening of Harry Potter, a book that's a modern children fiction classic. If you did not start the journey by reading the opening paragraphs, you would never know what kind of adventure awaits you, nested between the covers of this cumbersome piece of wood. Listening to classical music isn't much different. You may avoid it for a while, thinking it's too complex, too boring, a chore, shall we say. But you'll never know what it's really like, and, more importantly, whether you like it or not if you do not give it a shot. And there is evidence of benefits to your mental and physical health that can be acquired simply by listening to a classical tune. Listening to classical music can decrease your blood pressure and relieve your pain. A study published in the Journal of Health Psychology found that participants who listened to classical music had significantly lower blood pressure levels than participants who did not hear any music. Listening to classical music can also relieve stress and anxiety. According to researchers at the Kaohsiung Medical University in Taiwan, pregnant women reported that listening to classical music every week relieved their stress and anxiety. But all these facts aside, here's the key thing. Classical music is fun in more ways than one, even if it doesn't rhyme. Classical music can mimic the sounds of animals. The Whisper of Seasons And classical music can express a myriad of emotions. Have you ever heard of what death sounds like? Tickled your interest now, didn't I? Let's listen to this chromatic scale together. Were you able to imagine these images? The person who wrote this inspiring piece of music is John Williams, a famous movie composer. He knows the various ways needed to convey a sense of mystery and adventure to the listener, but there is more to it than that. His themes are made with the story behind the music in mind. Since you know what the plot is about, the music you're listening to can help you evoke the scenes of fighting, 
fleeing the romance behind the musical score. In other words, the knowledge you had beforehand will help you to better understand the music you listen to. Remember what we talked about experience? This is why it's so important. What is it, then, that we need to seek within our experience in order to gain better understanding of the subject at hand? We communicate with each other using words, representing combinations of sounds that form mutually recognizable meanings. Languages are made to establish these meanings and teach us how to convey them to those sharing them with us. Once you know this, you're one step closer to understanding how a composer's mind works. Although instrumental music cannot use the human languages, composers can use various musical languages to express their emotions and to tell their stories. The players are the speakers of this language. They study the pieces, interpret the intent of the composer, and deliver it to the audience. This is where our human qualities transform the work of art before us. The players can decide, spontaneously or not, to play the notes in a particularly moody manner. Our present state of mind can make them sound especially cheerful or morose. The composer's intent may be clearly stated, but their work always contains a transformative value. Feeling plays a role it never could in hard sciences. Answering the question of understanding, then, requires us to take into account these different musical facets, but first and foremost, to learn to enjoy the multitude of experiences a single note can deliver to us. There is no simple right or wrong answer here, except that any attempt to understand what you hear will make listening to classical music that much more interesting. It's an adventure of sorts. History of classical music is quite long, and the sheer number of famous composers and numbered symphonies can overwhelm you before you even start. This is what this video is about, to choose a particular piece for you, kick-starting the journey ahead. Two of the most common complaints regarding classical music are that it's too long. While it's true that some classical pieces are, in fact, lengthy, especially symphonies, there are lots of short classical music pieces that nonetheless have an immense value. And this is precisely where we'll start from, by simply dividing them into short and long musical pieces. Now, most of the short pieces have only one movement, while long ones have several, at least. We'll start listening with the short pieces, and short pieces will be divided into three levels demi semi quaver level, semi quaver level, and finally the quaver level. Names straight from a book of fantasy adventures, huh? Well, they are appropriate to the task. During the demi semi quaver level, we'll listen to a number of famous classical pieces and learn the story behind the music. The first piece on the menu is composed by none other than Beethoven the great Ludwig van, titled Für Elise, translated as For Elise. Actually, its full title is somewhat more confusing. Bagatelle number 25 in A minor W.O.O., Werke ohne Opusdal, works without opus number 59. However, since it was written for a lady named Elise, we'll call it just that. Already, we're delving into the story behind the notes. In Beethoven's time, very few composers gave names to their compositions, choosing instead to number them based on their previous work, sharing the same type and key. Bagatelle is a prime example of this. It falls under a short musical composition, typically for the piano, and of light, even mellow character. Beethoven's three piano sets and this piece are among the best-known bagatelles. When composers published their work, an opus number would be assigned to it. Beethoven only numbered his most important works in this manner, such as symphonies, sonatas, and large-scale compositions. 
In 1955, Georg Kinski, a German musical catalogist, gave an opus number to those smaller compositions originally left without one, and the number given to Elise indicates that this piece is the 59th work of Beethoven not having an opus number. A man named Ludwig Noll was the first to set sight on the original manuscript, publishing it with a claim that he saw the words for Elise appear on the top of the title page. Despite dedicating a lot of his pieces to women, Beethoven died a bachelor. Women and love nonetheless had a huge influence on his music, impacting listeners ever since. So, who was this mystery lady? Among Beethoven experts, there are a few schools of thoughts regarding her identity. Some researchers claim that Noel misread Beethoven's poor handwriting and claim that the piece was actually written for Therese Malfatti, former student of Beethoven's, whom he loved and proposed to in the same year that the piece was written. This was supported in a letter by Beethoven's friend Ignaz von Gleichenstein, who tells us that Beethoven intended to play Elise for Therese, but drank too much beforehand, rendering himself unable to perform the piece. According to Gleichenstein, Therese made Beethoven write her name on the title page. Others, like musicologist Klaus Martin Kopitz, claimed that Elise was no other than a German soprano Elisabeth Röckel, another of Beethoven's close friends. According to him, Beethoven dedicated the piano piece written in A minor in the memory of Elise, since they were separated in 1810, with Rockel relocating to Bamberg to work in a local theater. And there are some, like Bernard Appel, the director of the Beethoven Archive in Bonn, who said that the dedication could refer to any number of women, since Elise was quite a common name in the Vienna of Beethoven's time. The original script has been long lost, with some scholars going so far as to suggest that it never even existed. All that we have is an incomplete draft, sketched on a paper sheet apparently used by Beethoven when sketching out future ideas. The truth remains as elusive as ever. Nonetheless, it is certain that the person for whom the piece was intended could never even suppose that it would become immortal, something that only a great work of art can bestow. Not even Beethoven knew this since Four Elise got published some 40 years after his death. In other words, you've only got started, and can already claim to know more about the fate of this composition than the man who composed it. Not a bad start, right? Beethoven's contemporaries often claimed that his manners did not help him move successfully through the societal circles of his era. This became even more pronounced after he lost his hearing and retreated from the public life. His relationships with women were doomed to fail. Therese Malfatti turned him down and married another, while Miss Rockel chose his rival and a friend, Johann Nepomuk Hummel, for her husband, a move which certainly stung more than mere words can tell. This is in tune with the nature of music as a language, it is a particular form of expression used to convey composers' emotions and tell stories to the audience. In it, melody plays the key role. Try singing along to this melody. You have heard it before, perhaps in the McDonald's commercial. Oh, I wish I were already there. Or played by an ice cream truck rolling down your street. You have heard various pieces of classical music before and enjoyed them, connected them with joys and sorrows of your own life, without even being aware of what they are. It is your story as much as the composer's. Through melody, composers express their emotions, tell us what lies on their soul. One of the ways to do this is to use different keys. Major keys are often used to express positive emotions, while minor ones can express negatives. This is not set in stone, however. Some composers played with this notion and turned it around to great effect. Listen to the melody I'll play for you, in minor and major key, so you can hear the difference. What do you 
you say? How do you feel about the keys you just heard? What I just played for you is the main melody of this piece and has a name in classical music. We call it theme. Music can have one theme or several themes. 20th century composers such as Schoenberg, Webern, and Berg wrote music without using melodies, but more about that later. In Elise, Beethoven introduced three themes. The main theme is in minor key, while the other two themes are in major. Now, let's name these themes A, B, and C, and listen to what they sound like. If you think of this piece as a movie, then its themes represent the main roles, the protagonists. But they can't save the day by themselves. They need supporting roles. They need sidekicks. These sidekicks are called transitions. Transitions serve to connect one musical section to another, often introducing new musical materials. After that comes an element called the climax. Every story needs a bit of drama and tension to keep us on our toes. Finally, there's a showdown when the hero confronts the villain. Music thrives on these same principles. Here, repeated sixteenth notes and the diminished chords of theme C serve to create a little bit of tension, changing the peaceful mood of the composition. The tension is then resolved by a transition of the chromatic scale, bringing back the first, theme A, and ending the piece just the way it started. Lastly, the form of the whole piece needs to be mentioned. Here we have the main theme, theme A, alternating with contrasting themes, B and C, in the following order. A, B, A, C, A. In the realm of classical music, this is called the rondo form. It gained prominence during the last half of the 18th and in the early 19th century, and we'll be listening to a lot of music that follows this form over the next videos. Okay, let's listen to the whole piece together. Try to focus on the melody and transition, and how they're interacting with each other. <laughs> 